I think a, amazement uh, in, in the unconditional love that these children uh, project to us and sing as we come in and just, just the feeling of how hap truly happy they are that we've come back to see them again and again and again. And uh, we are, we're Poppy Land and Mommy Land and that's who we are when we come through the door. And uh, it's just an amazing feeling. Britt was this special girl. She was a strong, independent, happy young lady who loved her life, loved her family, loved her friends, had a very strong sense of faith. She was that kind of kid that always went for the underdog. And that's one part that we're really proud of her for, that she really stuck up for those that needed that extra help. And I think that's one of the reasons that she fell in love with Haiti, is that she wanted to help those that needed the help. The first time I came into Haiti was 10 days after the earthquake and the devastation was everywhere. And we came up here to the Hotel Montana and the entire building was pancaked, uh, rubble everywhere, pool was filled with concrete rubble. Uh, this whole area was unimaginable, none of this top or any of this was here. The one thing that was even harder was the fact that I knew my daughter was in that rubble and I knew that she had passed. And we could not say anything because we still had hope. And yet the reality was, was horrific. But it was the four stories high. So and this so is where it pancaked like that. So that tree, I'm gonna show you. This is where our daughter's room was uh, at the Hotel Montana. Even though it's really beautiful, that um, this is where she took her last breath, and it really is, um, it's very hard to think of it, that this is where she was. But um, as you can see, the beauty around it, and it's hard for us to see you know, life does go on and the buildings and things like that, but it's, um, it's hard to realize that she walked where we are walking and what we're looking at, she looked at, and so it's hard. Sacred ground to us. Yeah. It truly is. Right. As we were sadly planning Britt's funeral with Father John Madden at St. John's Church, uh, he, he looked over the desk with, with just a swell in his eyes and said to us, we cannot let her die in vain. And we agreed and Cheryl Ann had this beautiful text on her phone and I just naturally said, well, we're not and we're going to build an orphanage in Haiti. To honor her and we just agreed that at that moment before the funeral that that's what we were going to do we didn't know how we didn't you know understand Haiti at the time we just knew that we had such a great love for our daughter that we knew we wanted to honor her last wish even though she didn't know it um, when she sent Cheryl Ann that text so 
Then from there, things just evolved. Uh, money came in and we didn't ask for it. Um, this is the Bucket Brigade who bringing the concrete up the hill. Looking now northwest over the entire site. You can see the rebar crew is busy building cages. And material was uh, cement and rebar and that came from the Dominican Republic so uh, we had to ship that in and we only had a, a bulldozer path 1500 feet down the road and so we couldn't get trucks up here so our workers uh, would use uh, their manpower and haul this rebar up the hill which was just a great challenge and you know some of the some of the funny but challenging stories is the first time a year later we tried to we tried to get a truck up here with 40,000 pounds of rebar it went backwards down the hill and tipped on its side so they would never try it again and so we truly uh, built this building uh, bringing it one piece of rebar at a time we're bringing the walls up about nine feet right now. As you can see, we got a great crew. But guys, it's two o'clock, about 85 degrees. And it wasn't really all that easy, though. <laughs> I mean, I remember sitting at our kitchen table saying, oh, well, okay, we'll build an orphanage. I mean, it's in Haiti, so we started calling people and trying to research. I mean, how do you go about building an orphanage in Haiti? I mean, I know Len, I know that he'll get anything accomplished, and that wasn't it, but just, geez, how do you start that? I mean, and we started talk, calling people and asking, and we had a couple people tell us, well, for $20,000, you can build an orphanage. And I remember at that time going, oh my gosh, how are we gonna raise $20,000? That's a lot of money, we can't do that. And so then, Things started evolving, and one thing led to another, and you know, over <laughs> two million dollars later in the building, here we are. And I say, how did that person ever come up with twenty thousand dollars for an orphanage? Last night was kind of a zoo because they were all running around, um, you know, picking out backpacks and uh, making sure that you know, they spent hours getting their hair done and braiding their hair and the right ribbons and the right barrettes and uh, very proud of their new uniforms, uh, that kind of thing. So it was a hectic night getting ready and uh, an even more hectic morning getting 31 children ready to, um, you know, get out the door and on the bus. But so they were very excited. That's all they talked about. So we're inside um, what is the temporary church and was the temporary school. Um, after the earthquake, the school and the church both collapsed completely. And so they spent the last three years rebuilding um, the school behind us, which is behind this building. So up until this year, they were using this building to house 400 students. And it was divided into six different classrooms uh, with no walls or anything like that. So you can imagine it was loud like this. Four of them have never ever been in school and we have an 11 year old and a 10 year old and an 8 year old they've never been in school in their lives officially enrolled uh, and the rest of the children have never completed a full academic year uh, enrolled in any school other than uh, be like brit uh, which did a, a summer school catch-up program to try to get them prepared for you know when they enter here this year <laughs> The 
they know, and uh, you know, unlike kids in the states, I mean, some kids in the states obviously are excited to go back to school, but here it's all summer long. You know, can we go to school? Can we go to school? Can we? And, and it's just seen as such a, it's such a privilege to be able to go, and so to have that provided for them through Be Like Brit, through child sponsorship, they really understand. I really get a sense, even though they're young, of how important and how precious that gift of, of sponsorship and, and education really is for them. It's their only opportunity to do better than the generation before them. Okay. It's a really big life changing for the children to go to school in Haiti because uh, most of the poverty coming from uneducated people. Okay, when we have the children that go to school that change their life completely. Um, in my experience, and then I see a lot of kids that go to school and then even though the country is poor, but that help them to survive. They know what to do to save to survive. They have a way out. So when they don't have any education at all, so they don't have any way out in a country that is very poor that really don't offer much from the government. So people use the intelligence that they get from school to survive. <laughs> If they were not in school, so they were pretty much walking in the street without doing nothing, you know, being bad boys, I could even say, you know, because they don't have anything else to do. The parents were unable to put them to school. They have nothing. They just say they drop out for this year. And so many times they and stay, don't go to school at all. And then sometimes they start and then they stop in the middle of because the parents can't afford it. They don't have job. They don't have anything to do. So and then you end up being a big problem later on. Uh, it's called Ti Paradi, which means little paradise, and it's obviously a little remote. <laughs> um, and we found uh, a set of three brothers here um, that we brought in, and then another child from this area. So there's a you'll see when we get to the clearing, there's a bunch of houses together, um, and it's kind of you know more rural place, one of the more rural places that we uh, found. And you'll see the houses that they have are. Um, post earthquake you know NGO donated housing and it, the structures look quite nice and sound but if you get a look inside which they'll let us do um, there's like nine people in in one small room and it's really pretty uh... so they were they were living in this house here there's um, the, the mother the grandmother and nine children and it's only actually half of that structure that's theirs so obviously it was extremely overcrowded and the mother is, um, she's mute and um, not able to provide for the family. So it was um, after several visits and with the local and with the connection, personal connection with the family, we decided to, to take three of them in. So this is kind of standard for, um, you know, the rural poor in Haiti as far as the kitchen goes. Um, those who can afford buy charcoal at the market and those who can't collect twigs and so this is actually um, they use three stones um, to kind of retain the heat and then they use um, any kind of branches or twigs they can collect uh, you know to cook over that uh, families that have a little bit more more money can afford to buy charcoal at the market but this family doesn't uh, presumably they can't afford it and you know also where's the food you know they don't have any food on site so um, they probably eat when they can, um, which is most likely not every day, so. Today is the open market in Grand Guave. So pretty much we have people coming from everywhere coming here and sell whatever they have and do whatever they, they can. And any pretty much the kids usually with their parents in the open market even though it's school season or not. If they're not in school they usually found them here with their parents selling stuff. And then they grow up like that and then they continue doing the same thing. They don't really have a 
good economy in this. Uh, they don't really get much, but they just manage with what they have to live a, a life and any way that they can. We get this one, the ten. We find say your people tip for this one. Is it? We need to manage it. Epina, we. Oh, bye bye. Somebody didn't like us talking to him. So we just ran into uh, one of our children's grandparents who he was living with um, before he came here and um, you know, she's elderly, she's got several grandchildren in her care um, and her house you know, literally broke almost in half um, during an earthquake and so they, she has a small market stand here. Um, and people always ask us, how do you decide which child to bring in? And, you know, the, the short answer is, um, you know, we, we do basically home visits and, and vulnerability assessments, and we look at different um, categories like food and shelter and nutrition and medical and things like that. But the long answer is it really just depends, um, you know, on certain criteria, and then we always look at circumstances. Um, so everything is as sort of um, you know up, up for interpretation and and be like Brit's program committee when they wrote the the policy on on child recruitment um, wrote them so that they're somewhat flexible so we're not kind of boxed into you know category a b c things like that so we really have some flexibility and um, and I'm able to use some some of my own decision making and some of my own sort of gut feelings on how we decide who to bring those who to bring into the orphanage. Oh my daddy, no gone. Oh mm -hmm. okay, no gone. Bob is my messy. Quick, go, quick, go! So you see water in um in plastic bags and you'll see people kind of chew the uh bite the corner off and just kinda suck on this as they walk around and um you know three for uh five good which is less than 10 cents <laughs> so um, and that's how that a young girl who is presumably a teenager under the age of I would think probably 14 or so um, makes her living right now. So they essentially, they're in school, um, you know, Monday through Friday from 7 to 11 or 12. And then um, because the school days are short, um, at Be Like Brit, we have uh, an after school enrichment program. We have seven teachers on staff and they spend um, afternoons from 2 to 5 with them, Monday through Friday, going over their lessons, making sure their homework's done, grading their homework, checking their homework. Um, and really sort of reinforcing what they're learning because um, the teaching style in Haiti is very much uh, rote memorization. So, you know, the teacher will write something on the board and you'll copy it five times in your notebook uh, and be expected to learn it. But in the absence of seeing that, whatever you've copied before, trying to reproduce it sometimes is challenging. So we try to work in some more Western approaches to teaching and education to sort of supplement what they're getting in school here. What do we get? Part of the programming at Be Like Brit um, includes keeping the child connected with their community and family of origin. So what we're doing right now is um, doing community visits. We like to keep the kids connected to their communities because you know, I often refer to, um, to Be Like Brit as kind of a bubble of privilege. You know, it's not really real life in Haiti and so um, you know, it's important to keep them safe and secure, you know, in those walls, but connected to their to their roots, so that when they, you know, eventually you know, turn 18 and, and finish the program at Be Like Brit, that they know how to function in Haitian society, like like their family does, and like a Haitian would. And, and so, it's really our responsibility um, to tell the, these children their stories and where they came from. And so, by by doing regular family visitation you know, or you know, community visitation. Um, it really keeps them engaged with the friends that they knew before they came in to be like Brit. So it's really just a way of us keeping the child engaged um, and keeping them connected with their local culture and without isolating them too much. Um, 
you know, into into the program at Be Like Brit. We really want them to be well-rounded Haitian citizens, and part of that is obviously keeping them um, connected to the people that they know. And we feed the kids uh, um, three or four times a day and uh, we give them um, breakfast and we give them lunch and we give them dinner. That means three meals uh, per day. So we have uh, rice and uh, we have corn and sweet peas and we have maggi bouillon, we have uh, butter and we have this kind of uh, a macaroni to feed them. We have um, um, fish and we have uh, um, v, um, V8, we have vinegar. So we have everything. We've had, you know, tens of thousands of people volunteer, help us to help the children of Haiti. And it's very hard for Cheryl Lynn and I because we've always been the givers, not the receivers. And after years of therapy, <laughs> we've, learned to, we've learned to receive. And it's not for us, it's for the children. And that's what we have to, uh, that's what we've come to terms with. And we have 35 children living here at Be Like Brett. And every month the door has to be open and the bills have to be paid. And we've been t totally blessed with so many people, whether it's someone sponsoring a child at $33 a month, or somebody who's one. sending clothing oh, down, or space. peanut butter down. Oh. Oh it's kind of like color by number. Yeah, color by number. But they Paint make by number. So this is really exciting, Jonathan, in the eight hockey bags that we just brought down. Tuna fish, which is the protein, that, and peanut butter, which we constantly get donated, because uh, meat is very expensive down here, and it's a great way for the children to get their protein into them. Soap, I think that's self-explanatory. And the best part for the girls is hair clips, hair clips, hair clips, hair clips. And so uh, they love it, and the more, the, the more the merrier, <laughs> unless you're actually doing the hair, but the girls love that. So here's just some of the items that have been generously donated, and we just, we feel really honored. You know, this is all stuff that I had on a shopping list to go to the market in Pettiguav and buy with cash, you know, from the operating budget, and now we don't have to. It saves us hundreds of dollars. Because um, we actually almost, I mean, we made a list. We were going to go buy toothpaste, shampoo, this kind of stuff, you know, in the next day or two, because back to school, we got to be stocked up. And <laughs> lo and behold, hockey bags come down and, um, and uh, donors pull through for us. So it's amazing how, how fast people respond to that. Right here is one of our depot rooms that so many people have donated items to us. As you can see, so many, all the clothes here for the children. We have shoes, hundreds and hundreds of pairs of shoes have been donated for the kids, donated for the children. Sandals, sneakers, their school shoes, which is absolutely amazing. Underwear, and in Haiti, a big thing is the children's, the, the girls, their hair, all the the barrettes, <laughs> the bows, the ribbons, the more the merrier and the happier they are. So we have had many people, oh, and ribbons. Okay. <laughs> and this is mommy who helps with the children and does an incredible job with them and gets them prepared and right. gets them everything that they need, right? I am happy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> And so this is where a lot of our leftover items, our extra items, I should say, are stored, right here in the depot. And next we'll walk over. <laughs> this right here is one of our typical uh, rooms for the children. Each room has six beds <laughs> for the six children. Uh, for me, when we were designing this, it was really important that each child have their own space. Most of everything in Haiti, everyone shares everything, which is beautiful, but I wanted them to have something that if they get a special gift from somebody or a special toy, that they have it. 
So they have these boxes right here at the end of their beds that they put something special in. Right here are their cubbies that they have where they have their, to um, I'm sorry, their clothes, their personal items, their shoes, and each child has their own. And this was really important to me um, that they each have their own. Right, Chasha? We? Our goal is to be a self-sustaining orphanage. And uh, uh, once we have all our children sponsored, uh, we will have attained that self-sustainment. So uh, it's a very challenging goal, but yet one that is actual and that we can see, we can see us coming to the finish line. Well, I think another the challenge for the fundraising part of it really is, is that if we don't have the funding to keep this place open, Yes, it affects me and Len, but it also affects our children that are here, the 48 workers that we have here, the community that we have here. We feel a strong uh, sense of a responsibility here, not just for us. And so to have that worry every month, um, that's what motivates us to keep doing what we're doing. But we really are responsible for so much more than just the children here. I don't know that how healing it is here yeah. <laughs> for me. Do you know what I'm saying? It's very difficult for me to be here, meaning I love our children, I love everything, but it's still very difficult to be here. And so the healing process is always ongoing. I don't feel, for me personally, that the grief has ever gone away. I think that it just makes me sad to be here sometimes because I know that Brit, it affected her so much to be here and I'm proud of her for that it had that effect and that she wanted to come back and change it but it just makes me sad that she didn't get to do that she doesn't get to be a part of this physically even though I know that she really this was what she wanted and I know that but as her mom personally I wish she was like right here next to me doing all of this you know, the, the raw reality is our daughter has passed. She's gone. And um, the, day that our first, the day that our first child came into this orphanage, Cheryl Ann and I were, um, it, it was a bittersweet moment. It was just looking at this little boy that his aunt brought in and just understanding that his life, as our lives have been changed forever, his life was going to be changed forever. And I looked down at him and, you know, I said, come on, yay, which is, how are you? And his first words to me were, grand goo, grand goo, which is, I'm hungry, I'm hungry. And I just knew at that moment that Brit's spirit would live on helping these children. She would continue to be that voice that she was for those that did not have one. And that's what we're doing here at Be Like Brett. We're helping those children that she fell in love with and hated.